All right, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to go ahead and uh, get started with uh, with this workshop. So today we'll be going through how to achieve fastest CPU inference performance for object detection models, uh, specifically focusing on YOLO uh, and YOLO v5. My name is Mark Kurtz. I direct the uh, machine learning team here at Neuromagic, and I'm joined by a couple of my colleagues uh, that work here. Michael Goyne, who is our product engineering lead, um, Alex Marquez, uh, who is our ML research lead, and then uh, Ben Finneran, who is our ML engineering lead. So they will all be available and, um, and answering questions as, uh, as we go through. And um, thank you all for, uh, for joining in. To go through a quick a couple or, or a quick couple of housekeeping items, uh, this meeting is being recorded and we will share it out within 24 hours. So we'll have this available on YouTube, LinkedIn, Twitter, our uh, Deep Source community Slack, as well as uh, on our Neuromagic website. Additionally, please feel free to uh, to get involved via Q and A. Um, so click on activities to do this. Click on the activities button in the um, in the lower right, and within that you'll have a Q&A feature where you can ask questions. Um, we will be going through the questions at the end of the presentation. So feel free to upvote those questions by liking them, and, uh, and we'll go through the, the most popular ones. Additionally, uh, as I said, um, our engineers will be on call and uh, answering any questions as they, uh, as they come in through the chat feature. So feel free, if anything's confusing, to, uh, to reach out, and uh, we'll go through and answer those. Um, and towards the end, Ben, Alex, uh, ben and Alex will be going through and answering those top questions. To uh, to start off and to test it out, uh, if we can, can everybody try and go into that Q&A feature and then just let us know what uh, uh, where you're joining in from. So city, uh, city and country. We'd love to see how much, uh, uh, you know, where where everybody is being represented from. So go ahead and let that go for a few minutes, but, uh, but go ahead and uh, send those in. So it looks like we have uh, some people in from uh, uh, Cairo, Egypt, uh, Tel Aviv, Israel, and uh, Romania. Wow. And then uh, in from London. Oh, wow. Quite a few people coming in. Uh, we have Ger uh, Germany, which is great. A lot of European. Um, uh, USA from Lafayette. Uh, another Germany, Morocco, uh, Albania. Poland, Lebanon, Italy. So a lot of a lot of European representations. Great to see. Thank you, uh, thank you, everyone. I will just let that go for another minute. See if we have anybody uh, anybody else coming in. Then we'll uh, then we'll dive in. Uh, Canada, Turkey, Algeria, Morocco. A few people in Morocco. So it's great to see. Great to see a lot of um, a lot of different uh, people uh, being able to join in from all across the world, uh, especially um, through. Uh, uh, through new technology and through Google Meet. Um, it's great to see. So let's go ahead and dive in then. So going through today's agenda, what we'll walk through is a quick background on object detection, talking through uh, past uh, past solutions and the history of it. Uh, we'll also introduce Ultralytics and, and compound scaling. Ultralytics being the repository that we built on top of and enabled uh, better performance with. Then we'll talk over sparsifying which uh, when we're talking over sparsifying, we mean optimizing uh, YOLO v5 models for performance. We'll go through why we're doing that. Um, we'll talk through ways of uh, being able to adapt that to your data set, such as sparse transfer learning, as well as sparsifying from scratch. And then we'll go through deploying YOLO v5. So we'll talk over exporting to Onyx, uh, deep sparse Python, and uh, the server API. And then uh, we'll close out with uh, future research and next steps in discussion. So given all that, let's go ahead and uh, dive in. So through the backgrounds, um, one thing to uh, to call out is, uh, you know, for object detection, we're looking at image and video analysis. So what objects are where, right? Given an image coming in um, or screen or uh, frames from a video, we want to be able to track uh, individual objects throughout that frame and uh, be able to locate them in that. And this is useful for a lot of different uh, a lot of different reasons for uh, pedestrian detection, people counting, face detection text detection, pose detection, and uh, many, many more. Looking at a little bit of the history, so before 2014, we had more of a traditional object detection approach. Uh, so things like the Viola Jones detector, HOG detector, DPM, 
these were all focused on um, focused on more feature engineering and then using a lot of SVMs on top. So uh, HOG doing history of uh, histogram of gradients. So doing histograms and things like that to try and detect objects uh, objects within images. After 2014, once uh, deep learning really started catching on, uh, specifically in 2014 for the, uh, for the object detection domain, we have RCNN, which was introduced as a two-stage detection. So when we're looking at object detection, we're, uh, there are two potential stages in there. One is just finding the general regions within an image that could contain objects, right, that isn't just background. And then the second is going through and putting boxes around those and, uh, and classifying those. So RCNN and then faster RCN after that were two-stage detectors. These two-stage detectors generally run slower but are very, very accurate. After that, uh, one-stage detection came in where they were doing a end-to-end uh, -end flow. So instead of having these two parts of the network, two individual networks working together, everything went through one stage. So you had both the object locality or the object uh, um, proposals as well as the classification all through one network. So the first one uh, to really do this was YOLO. And then quickly after that, SSD followed up. So this enabled much faster performance for object detection tasks. Uh, in terms of frame rates and um, throughput as compared to the uh, two-stage detection uh, previous approaches. Uh, SSD was a little bit more accurate. YOLO um, only had set bounding boxes that, uh, that could go through and um, predict. SSD was able to do an offset and a scaling past that, so it was a little bit more accurate in terms of, uh, in terms of map or the mean average precision. And then YOLO v3 came out after that, uh, which was actually a very entertaining paper. I recommend everyone reading through that. A uh, very entertaining paper, but it combined the best of all the recent research, including the advancements in SSD and others throughout the years in uh, 2018. So that brings us into Ultralytics. So YOLO v3 was originally implemented in Darknet, uh, Darknet being a C++-based machine learning uh, framework. And because it's C++-based, it makes it harder to adapt and harder to use as compared to Python. And it wasn't built on top of a well-used framework like, uh, like PyTorch or TensorFlow. So Ultralytics ported this to PyTorch in 2018, and um, with that, it got a lot of adoption. Then uh, uh, building on top of that, I kept making improvements to the Yolo v3 backing, and that's when Yolo v5 was announced in 2020. So there were multiple improvements from Yolo v3 uh, that ended up being classified as Yolo v5. One of the core improvements on top of this is compound scaling. And this is where we create models of different sizes for trade-offs between accuracy and performance. As we can see, YOLO V5S is going to be the fastest, where this is measured in uh, milliseconds per image, so our latency to get back an image. Uh, so YOLO V5S is going to be the fastest, and then YOLO V5X is going to be the slowest, slowest but significantly more accurate. And real quick, we're going to go ahead and kick off a poll before we go into what is sparsification now that we've gone through that background. Um, so let me go ahead and open up that poll real fast. And Send it, send it live. There we go. So what we'd like to know, you should have gotten a notification on your level, right? What object detection models and libraries are you currently using? Uh, so we have YOLO v3 uh, and Ultralytics, uh, as well as Darknet, YOLO v4 and Darknet, YOLO v5 and Ultralytics, uh, ResNet or Mobile, uh, MobileNet SSD, Faster RCNN, and then other. And if you're using another, feel free to, uh, to send that out in chat um, to let us know. So we'll keep that open for a few, uh, for a few minutes. We have a few people coming in, or a few, quite a few votes coming in already. We'll leave that going for just a few more minutes, uh, or another minute, and then we'll end the poll. Um, but yeah, just generally curious from our side what people are using. We've, uh, we've gone through and sparsified um, YOLO v3, YOLO v5, as well as um, uh, some SSDs like, uh, like a Resident 50 SSD. So very curious on that. I will leave that open for another 15 seconds, and then, uh, and then close it out. Thank you for everyone that has, uh, that has voted so far. All right, great. So I'm going to go ahead and close it out now. And in the poll, you should see the results. It uh, looks like quite a few people using uh, YOLO v5 and Ultralytics, uh, as well as uh, ResNet or MobileNet SSD. Uh, so very interesting. A um, few people using YOLO v4 Darknet, and then a few people using faster RCNN. Um, so yeah, great. Thank you. Uh, thank you, everyone, uh, for that. Let's go ahead and dive into why we would sparsify. So one thing to call out is that neural networks are redundant. 
Uh, with this, we can remove meaning pruning and reduce meaning quantization connections within that network with limited effect on accuracy. So after we do this, we can leverage this to create smaller and faster models, right? Benefiting um, server deployments, edge deployments, and, uh, and kind of all over edge, meaning that uh, we're on a phone or wherever it is, we want smaller models to be able to fit on that device and additionally faster models to get back to the user immediately. And then in the server case, faster models to, uh, to be able to run our inferences cheaper. And what this ultimately does is it shifts the Pareto frontier that we saw earlier in that compound scaling past what, uh, what it can do alone. So we can see YOLO V5 and YOLO, v, uh, uh, YOLO V5S and YOLO V5L showing this Pareto frontier here where we're scaling uh, map versus, uh, versus latency. And by pruning and quantization, we were able to shift the scale over to the left significantly, right, to a 4x faster um, performance uh, utilizing uh, deep sparse with pruning and quantization. So let's go ahead and dive into ways to do this. So let's talk over sparse transfer learning. One thing is, um, uh, so first we'll start with a sparse architecture created on a large data set such as Coco. Uh, so we're going to train and then prune on that upstream. Uh, we're going to fine tune the sparse model uh, on top of that, on that smaller data set such as VOC. And what we're going to do whenever we're fine tuning is we're going to preserve those, uh, preserve those masks and um, preserve those masks and update only the weights. So the benefits of doing this is that we don't have any sparsification hyperparams that we have to deal with. It's exactly the same as doing dense transfer learning. And in general, it's going to work as well or better than dense. We have a few, uh, few papers actually out on this, especially in the image classification and uh, in segmentation domain, where we show that these sparse models generalize very well and learn a general, uh, general architecture that doesn't overfit as much to the downstream data sets as what a dense is capable of doing. Talking through the downsides of sparse transfer learning. Uh, well, one is that sparse fine from scratch uh, generally gives better trade-off on large or out of distribution data sets. So what I mean by that is if we have a really large data set that, uh, that we have more than enough data, it might be bigger than our uh, original data set that we started on. Generally, we're going to want to sparsify on that data set because it's going to have more data in it that we can find a better architecture with it, a uh, better sparse architecture with it. Additionally, uh, if it's an out of distribution data set, then we're going to want to train and sparsify on that downstream, on that other data set, so that um, we're learning a general architecture that works for that specific distribution. But what we can see is on the right is that the results very closely match what happened on Coco. Uh, so this is taking a Coco, uh, Coco model that's uh, sparsified and then transferring it to the VOC data set. So you can see the dense model comes out around here in terms of map. Uh, so for the v 5 l we're around 69. And then for the YOLO V5L pruned and quantized, we're at, uh, we're at around 67. Um, so a little bit of a drop, but significant performance increase, and again, getting that 4x faster on top of it. So diving in a little bit more, we have pre-sparsified models on Coco available in the sparse zoo. And additionally, with that, we have recipes for sparse transfer learning available with those models. Uh, these recipes encode the hyperparameters around sparse transfer, specifically being able to keep those, uh, that sparse architecture intact and allowing the weights to update. Uh, all of this is enabled through easy to use APIs and CLIs built into SparseML, SparseML being our training software um, and optimization software. We'll go through some examples of using that. So what you can do uh, to be able to enable this is do pip install SparseML Torch Vision. And then kick off a training run, just like this. SparseML.yolov5.train. This installs. So whenever we do SparseML, it installs uh, CLIs that are ready to go that you can kick off and uh, begin running. Um, and let's go ahead and dive into an example of doing that on Colab. So let me share. So what we've done is um, already gone ahead and uh, installed. And actually, sorry, I just noticed something. Let me fix one thing real fast. Looks like it installed an older version of SparseML. All right, and let's just get the correct version installed. And then we'll kick off our training run. So we're gonna go through and run the install. This installs the uh, CLI, ready to go. And then we'll kick off our training run. So what we're gonna do is look at the Cocoa 128 
data set. So this is just the first 128 images um, from uh, from Coco. Uh, we're just doing this to uh, show what a very quick sparse transfer run would look like. We're going to use a Yolo V5S model. We're going to use the weights from the sparse zoo, and then we're going to use our sparse transfer recipe from the sparse zoo. And we're going to go ahead and kick that off. All right, and you'll notice that we are logging two weights and biases up here. So um, we will uh, we'll be coming back to this once this completes and then show that working. Until then, let's go ahead and jump back into the presentation. And looking through the recipe fundamentals, so the recipe that we just ran on there, the core fundamental for it is something called a constant pruning modifier. And this is all that it looks like to create one of these um, uh, constant pruning, or one of these transfers, sparse transfer recipes. We're going to do something called uh, just create a group of pruning modifiers in a YAML file. And then we're going to use something called a constant pruning modifier. So what this is saying is that start at epoch zero and then target all prunable params and just preserve the sparsity mass on top of those. And that's going to go through what no matter the training integration you have, um, it's going to go through and make sure that, uh, that those sparsity mass stay intact. And that's what's happening under the hood as, uh, as that training run that we just kicked off is, uh, is going through, uh, which we'll come back to in a little bit. And then additionally, let's go ahead and dive into a sparse zoo Yolo V5S example to give, um, to give a little bit more concreteness to what that would look like for a more complicated setup. So let me go ahead and share. So this is a sparse zoo. This is Yolo V5S prune quantize uh, model. And we have the recipes available so you can look through them. So this is set up so that uh, you have general hyperparameters you can change up here. So you can change how many epochs it runs for, uh, the, uh, the LRs that it does. These LRs are set to match what Ultralytics does uh, inherently. And, um, and then additionally, what you'll see is that it adds in quantization at the end. And we'll go through quantization in, um, in a little bit, but just pointing out that these recipes are all easily, readily available and uh, uh, adaptable for, uh, for your needs. And then let's dive into sparsifying from scratch. So what we want to do is create a sparse architecture on the desired data set for, uh, for deployment. Uh, so this means that we're going to train on that data set, then prune, and then quantize um, all on that singular data set rather than training on a much or rather than training and pruning on a much larger data set. So the benefits of this or what we went through uh, a little bit earlier is that we enable higher accuracy for large data sets. Uh, the sparse architecture is fitted to the general solution for that exact data set rather than being a general one that may not transfer well to uh, to our given data set. And we can prune custom models. There's no need for the upstream. So we can adapt uh, recipes as needed to be able to do our own models rather than needing um, these large upstream models to be pruned uh, beforehand. Uh, so, uh, so the downside is that we do have to do hyperparameter tuning for sparsification. And this is something that we do a lot at, Spar at uh, Neural Magic, and um, we have best practices around this and uh, definitely willing to help you out. We have a Slack community that, uh, that enables being able to do this. Additionally, we have uh, sparse mail CLIs and uh, APIs that are used for the exact same flow. Um, so uh, the recipes are changed to sparsify from scratch. And then uh, we have sample recipes for cocoa that are adaptable to your data sets and found on the sparse zoo. Um, so feel free to explore those and then use those. And then you'll just use the exact same CLIs that, uh, that we kicked off beforehand for the sparse transfer. And running through some recipe fundamentals for sparsifying from scratch. So one, one of the kind of core things and one of the easiest things is the global magnitude pruning modifier. So what we're going to do is uh, in a YAML file, we'll say that we have pruning modifiers. And uh, we'll set up a global magnitude pruning modifier. So what this is going to say is we want to start at 5% sparsity at epoch zero. And then we want to go to a final sparsity at, um, of 80% at epoch 25. And we're going to update that um, one epoch at a time. So the big thing here is that pruning is an iterative process whenever we're doing this. So that's the reason why you see the start epoch and this end epoch. So we're only going to prune away a few of the weights at a time. Um, as we're going, and what it's actually doing with global magnitude, it's pruning away the, the weights that are closest to zero. So the ones that are closest to zero that didn't matter as much to our solution and we're getting regularized away, we're going to prune those and remove those and set those to zero. 
past that, what happens is uh, we'll, you know, at Epoch Zero, we'll remove 5% of the weights across the entire network. And then at Epoch 6, we're going to remove another set of weights. What this enables is for the, uh, for the training process to re-regularize the weights and push the next un unnecessary weights and adapt the uh, architecture towards zero so that uh, so we can prune. And this gives uh, quite a bit higher accuracy as compared to just pruning all at once. And then finally, the quantization modifier. So this is enabled through sparse ML as well. We have a, uh, uh, so you can set up just a general group and then set the quantization modifier here. The, and uh, the core things here are that uh, the epoch to start at. So for example, start at epoch 50, and then which modules within our PyTorch model do we want to, uh, do we want to quantize? So for example, if you just put in model here, it's going to go through and quantize, try and quantize everything within that model, and that's generally the easiest. For the yellow V5, we don't want to quantize the NMS that happens at the end, so we just target the high level, um, the high level layers that uh, are built inside of there. And let's go ahead and uh, before we kick off this poll, let's go ahead and check in on our uh, check in on our results. So what we'll see is that uh, the weights and biases run has been ongoing, and then we're completed. So you'll see that uh, we're doing sparse transfer. Uh, map metric is here. Let me go ahead and maximize that a little bit more. Uh, so you can see that we started growing and sparse transfer was working very, very well. And we got all the way up to about a 75% uh, map at 0 0.5. We dropped a little bit as soon as quantization was introduced, and that's where we'd want to tune a little bit of the quantization hyperparams, like we lower the learning rate. But overall, this gets us a very successful transfer run very quickly, and uh, we're able to move directly into deployment after this. To give some examples of what that looks like afterwards, uh, we can look at uh, through weights and biases and ultralytic integration. We can look at some sample uh, images. So you can see it's doing very well across all these. A lot of different um, classes being thrown, uh, being uh, collected here, and uh, zebra being correct, and um, and things like that. All right, great. So let's go ahead and dive into uh, poll number three. I'm going to go ahead and make that live. So before we go into deployment, what we wanted to know is what challenges do you have when deploying object detection models currently? So do you have problems with performance, with general accuracy, with accuracy for specific object classes or sizes, you know, small, medium, large sizes, um, hardware availability and scalability, or, um, or other issues? So we'll go ahead and leave that live for about a minute. We have a few votes coming in. Again, you should have seen a notification in the lower right um, showing that. So we'll give that a few seconds to, uh, to go through. Uh, one question I saw come in real fast was a clarification on, how, on what type of quantization we were doing. We are doing quantization aware training. So this means that we're running for a few epochs. As you saw in that weights and biases run, there were two training epochs that went by with, uh, with the quantization process. And then another quick question that came in while we're waiting on the results from this poll was uh, uh, the clarif uh, clarification of if we're doing unstructured or structured pruning. So everything we're doing here is unstructured. And the reason why is because we can get to significantly high sparse, higher sparsity levels as compared to structured. So unstructured means that we're going to keep all of the weight and activation shapes exactly the same, and we're going to remove connections within the weights. Structured, we would actually be changing the tensor sizes within those and removing channels and um, uh, filters potentially. Uh, it's a lot. It's a lot harder to do. It takes a little. Uh, takes some more time to be able to do that, and we're not able to get to as high of uh, sparsity. It is something that we're looking at exploring in the future. But going back to the compound sparsification, or sorry, the compound um, scaling that we went over earlier, that's mainly what that compound scaling is doing is a structural approach to get a good model. So rather than doing uh, structural pruning on top of the Yolo V5 models, we'd recommend going with Yolo V5s and M. Um, whichever one that fits your needs, and then sparsifying on top of that, so you don't have to go through the uh, the structural the issues with structural and trying to get performance on top of them. All right, I'm going to go ahead and end the poll here, and uh, you should be able to see the results. Uh, so we have quite a few that uh, that show. I think the top result, yeah, it looks like the top result is hardware availability and scalability. 
Um, so definitely a core, core complaint that we've heard as well, just being able to get access to uh, GPUs and things like that. And then another issue, not the next top issue is performance. So definitely another thing that, uh, that we've heard. So let's go ahead and talk over how, um, how we can realize the performance gains and be able to utilize that for better scalability and deployment. So first, before we dive into actually deploying with DeepSparse, uh, we need to export to Onyx. So this is a sample graph on the right of what an Onyx looks like, uh, Onyx graph looks like. Um, and it's a general file format for representing neural networks. So this, it supports conversions from many standard frameworks such as PyTorch and TensorFlow. And with all of these, represents them in the exact same uh, graph format. So it makes it very easy for um, inference engines to be able to target a single format. And then no matter where you trained at or what framework you use for training, uh, you can target that Onyx format so that the inference engine doesn't have to support all the different ones. Given this, this is why DeepSparse takes in Onyx files as input. So this is how you tell DeepSparse what is the graph that you want to run uh, so that it can give you the correct answers for your given inputs. Again, SparseML APIs and CLIs enable exporting to Onyx. Um, so let's go ahead and go through an example. So you can just use, after you've installed SparseML, you can just use sparseml.yolov5.export Onyx with your trained weights. For example, the weights that we just trained um, previously on the COCO128, you'll just use this command in your terminal and uh, be able to immediately deploy it. And again, Sparseu, where we keep all of our models and recipes, this additionally contains pre-exported Onyx models for benchmarking and deployment. And uh, you can reference those with what we call zoo stops. So let's go ahead and talk over deploying um, setup, annotation, and benchmarking. So first, we want to install DeepSparse. DeepSparse is the inference engine that we make generally available at Neural Magic. And what it enables you to do is get GPU class performance on commodity CPUs, uh, utilizing those sparse architectures, because we can remove a significant amount of the compute, theoretical compute, from those networks by introducing the zeros. We don't have to run that, and it makes the execution within DeepSparse much faster with its proprietary technology. Additionally, DeepSparse is going to utilize the CPU caches um, uh, to, uh, to be able to get faster memory access um, and run the models faster. So given the faster memory access and the reduction in compute, that's how we get to the GPU class speeds. So you can install it uh, for something that's ready to deploy with YOLO uh, with this command pip install deep sparse YOLO and server. The annotation API is available once you do that. It's a quick way to check the results. So you can pass in, um, just call this and then pass in a source image and it will immediately show you how accurate uh, this model is in a, uh, in a qualitative way. And then additionally, there's a benchmarking API that installs with it, which is a quick way to check performance. So we can do deepsparse.benchmark and then pass in what we said earlier, which is a zoo stop. So this is going to pass in a pruned and quantized model. These can be found on the sparse zoo, um, additionally in our documentation, to be able to uh, benchmark one of these. So let me go ahead and flip over my, uh, my screen to a different, uh, different setup and we'll show what this looks like running. Okay, great. So now what we have is, uh, so let's go ahead and do, I've already installed it on here, but I'll just show the command for install. Uh, for reference. So what we'll do is pip install. And you can see it's already installed. And let's go ahead and kick off a um, an annotate. So what we can do is first download an image using this command. And then the deep source object uh, annotate uh, can be kicked off and run. Additionally, you can pass in um, dash dash source zero to annotate, annotate your live webcam feed. And uh, if anybody's seen us at, um, at any of the conferences like CVPR, NeurIPS, anything like that, this is exactly what we're doing. So what this is gonna do is um, uh, create the model and then annotate that in the, uh, in the background. Unfortunately, this is on a separate server, so I'm gonna go ahead and kill that because I can't show the results, but we do have the results in our documentation on DeepSparse. What we can show on the server though is the benchmark results. So what we'll first do is kick off a benchmarking run. We're gonna take a YOLO V5S model the baseline model, so this is going to be an FP32 um, uh, dense model. So we're going to kick that off. 
Uh, this is just going to go through a multi-stream by default setup. So you can see I'm on an AVX512 system that has uh, VNI has 24 cores on it. And uh, we're going to start running a benchmark. So we're going to do a multi-stream benchmark, meaning that we're hitting it with multiple streams. And then you can see that our throughput got to about 104 items per second on that at a latency of um, about 114 milliseconds per batch. And then let's go ahead and kick off for comparison what the prune quantized YOLO V5S model looks like. So we have YOLO V5S, and then we're going to take the prune quantized version with that. And we're going to compare a benchmark on top of that. So we'll let that run through, uh, running on the same system. And uh, it'll automatically download these models from the, uh, from the Spark Studio so that uh, you can run this on any system. There we go. So we got two, uh, 259 uh, items per second. For YOLO V5L, we'll see even bigger of an improvement. And additionally, for, uh, for throughput, we'll see an even greater improvement. But just showing a little bit on what, uh, what pruning and quantization and running deep sparse can give for that, uh, for that performance benefit. Great. So let me switch back over to our presentation. And we can continue going through. Um, so next is deploying with a Python, uh, deploying either through a Python API or a server. So DeepSparse has a Python API built in where we can run this code. So what we'll say is from deepsparse.pipeline import pipeline. And what this allows you to do is create a YOLO pipeline that um, contains all the pre-processing, all the post-processing, as well as takes in the Onyx model that, uh, that you want to run. So for example, we're going to pass in a zoo stub, but you can pass in a local, excuse me, a local model.onyx that, uh, that you've trained uh, and export using export command and then run through the pipeline. So then we can just pass in images uh, into it. So this can take in uh, files and, uh, and a few other formats and uh, give it an IOU threshold and a confidence threshold. These are the settings for YOLO v5 uh, that we have documentation around. And then it's going to give you the pipeline outputs so you're ready to go and uh, can plug this in anywhere. Additionally, we have the DeepSparse server, which is installed with, uh, with DeepSparse. And what we can do is say DeepSparse.server. We can give it a task YOLO and a model path, and it will spin up a server that you can then use for HTTP requests. So to show that real fast, let me go and switch over to our terminal window. And we can show what that looks like. Great, so let's clear out the benchmarks. So we're on the same system we just were on. And then we can kick off uh, DeepSparse.server, give it a task YOLO, and then a model path. Um, what this is going to do is it's going to create the engine underneath. And then you can see it uh, spins up with a UVCorn uh, server available at um, the 5543 port. You can change the port as needed. And this has uh, convenient APIs that are ready to go. If you spin this up locally, you can go to, as soon as you visit that uh, the website, it has uh, documentation through um, our documentation that uh, is automatically set up so that it will show you exactly how to inference into the system and uh, make that available. You can see that the routes were created were predict and then predict from files. So you can use those immediately on, um, on, your, on your server and uh, be ready. And this can plug into SageMaker or any other orchestration software and be ready to go. The benefit is that this is also set up for uh, multi-stream setups. So it gives greater performance um, across multiple streams. So uh, you can just have this set up, uh, have multiple HTTP requests coming in at once, and it is going to handle that automatically for you to get the best performance as, uh, as those streams come in. Great. And let's go ahead and switch back to the presentation. And we can finish off. All right. And one thing to call out is uh, DeepSparse licensing. So uh, DeepSparse is free to use for community and research purposes. Uh, we have uh, commercially available with full support and production-ready integrations for anything that you might need. 
and uh, contact us to find out more on how we can make your deployments faster, cheaper, and more accurate. Um, visit hps colon slash slash neuralmatch.com slash deepsparse dash engine uh, to find out more, or just go to neuralmatch.com and uh, I'll walk you through how to get there. And then looking at future research that, uh, that we're working on right now and going to be open sourcing soon. Uh, so we have YOLO v5, v6 models coming soon. These uh, improve the trade-off between performance and accuracy. They add another convolutional head and um, uh, detection head so that uh, they work, uh, so that they get um, higher accuracy across the board. And these models are working on uh, pruning and quantizing currently. We're additionally adding in hardware-aware pruning approaches. So specifically targeting the deep source engine so that we can figure out uh, not all layers are created equally meaning that uh, some layers are more memory bound than others and some layers are more compute bound. Layers that are more compute bound, we want to target more to get more speed up. And this is exactly what we're working on currently so that we can get a better speed up at a given accuracy level. And then finally, uh, we're working on improvements utilizing knowledge distillation. There's uh, prior research in the, uh, in the object detection community and uh, research community where knowledge distillation actually improves results by, uh, by a decent amount. And we're looking at that to improve our results even further. So distilling from larger models to improve our accuracy recovery uh, with pruning. And uh, let us know any use cases and models we should be targeting. We'd be happy to, uh, to dive through those. Then going through some closing remarks. Uh, you can get started with your own data. Go to neuromatch.com slash use cases. This will walk you through exactly what we were just going through. Uh, join our community to ask questions and stay current. Uh, stay current. We have normatch.com slash community. We have a Slack community that is very active. All of our uh, engineers are active on there to help uh, help you get to a, uh, a performance solution. And then if you think our project is awesome, start on GitHub. Uh, go to github.com slash neuralmagic. Sparse ML, again, being for model optimization. Deep Sparse being for the deployment. And then Sparse where we store our uh, pre-trained recipes and, uh, and models. And then additionally, you can stay current with our news on your own time by following us on Twitter at, uh, at Neuromagic. So we are, and then one final thing is that we are software delivery AI and um, we're hiring. Uh, so if you're interested in that, definitely go to neuromagic.com slash careers and, uh, and take a look at uh, what we're hiring for. So thank you everyone. Uh, as we said, support our project on GitHub, follow and engage on Twitter, and then join our DSource community in Slack. And then we'll go ahead and open it up for discussion and, uh, and Q&A. And I'll hand it over to Ben and Alex to go ahead and run through those. All right, definitely. I see a um, question in the comments on, on YOLO X. Um, definitely, this has been on our radar and is on going through prioritization for um, roadmap. Definitely not on the near term. But um, you know, given the repository is similar, it's definitely something that we could work with the community on, on getting up. And um, definitely is a model that um, we could only specify and see speed up on um, with our tooling. Open up QA. All right, so you have a question. Um, can we use deep sparse for commercial use? Um, so right now, um, we have an we have an open source license for um, for personal use for deep sparse for uh, commercial use. Uh, it's definitely best to reach out to um, to our uh, go to market team and to the company um, either through the deep sparse community channel or reaching out through the email on our website. Um, you know, definitely happy to talk about uh, commercial use cases and how we can support there. Okay, and then um, with the question, what about sparsify and creating your own recipes? Um, so Sparsify is a um, tool that came out in our original open source release, uh, for those who aren't aware, that takes an Onyx model um, and creates a um, SparseML recipe that can be used to um, prove the model. Um, you know, the SparseML tool has come a long way since then. We've introduced integrations for, um, for BERT, um, for image segmentation, and other use cases that um, aren't supported right now. Sparsify, we're going through an overhaul of that um, that will um, you know, provide easier ways of creating recipes. Um, for now, um, you know, it's you're still able to use existing Sparsify tooling, um, but when you run into issues, definitely opening up issues on GitHub and can support getting recipes uh, put together or following our uh, tutorials. But always feel free to reach out to the community or on GitHub issues with any questions on custom integrations.
Yeah, so uh, I, I see here a question about if we can install weights and run in local instead of running on cloud. And absolutely, uh, everything that Mark showed before, uh, you can download locally and, and run on your own machine. Yeah. Just no yeah. requisite to run on the cloud. Yep. Uh, we we're just running on cloud. I'll just demonstrate that it's easy to install and get set up in a few steps. Um, but definitely, we, we run on our own Linux boxes. Um, everything is installed locally from our packages. Um, does your infant server support uh, batching like um, Bento, ML, or other model uh, serving tools? Um, so this means getting in um, different. Um, getting a separate request and pulling to a batch that's uh, not supported right now. Um, we have support for uh, one static batch. So um, taking in um, requests of a known batch size and in our upcoming release will support dynamic batch. Um, so anything um, anything coming in um, can be um, can be processed by the engine uh, regardless of batch size. Um, and the engines work very hard on a um, multi-stream execution. So regardless of um, you know, how many requests are coming in, the, en the DSource engine um, is able to partition resources uh, such that it can you know, execute in parallel multiple uh, requests coming in. So there's no need to uh, batch to get around the static batch requirement. So I see here, uh, can we get uh, can we vary get more models on the Pareto curve by varying sparsity and accuracy trade off by modifying the recipes? Uh, and the answer is absolutely. I mean, uh, we encourage users to to you know engage with the with our recipes and and uh, adapt them to the, their own uh, use cases as as much as they can. Uh, in the future, we are actually planning on uh, open sourcing our zoo, so users can, uh, will be able to actually push their own models there, and so they can make their contributions public. Uh, but yeah, in, uh, the, the short answer is yes, absolutely. And also follow up to that is that we are currently actively working on updating our uh, YOLO v5 models, as Mark mentioned, uh, to, the, the, to the v6 version of the YOLO v5 repo. And in that push, we're probably gonna extend also the number of models that we'll be uh, supporting. Great. And then, so you have another question on, is there any way to deploy models optimized with deep sparse with, uh, with KSERV? So um, right now, we don't have integration uh, with uh, Kubernetes for serving, but definitely there are, uh, I don't believe there's any engineering restrictions around this. So we can support this um, if it's something you're looking on getting on immediately. But uh, um, deployment integration with Kubernetes is on our meeting term roadmap for sure. So I think there are more questions in the comments. Scroll back a few there. Yeah, we have a question. How many pruning methods are supported in uh, Sparse and Up? Uh, it's a great question. And then Alex, definitely feel free to chime if I'm missing any. Um, okay. We support, um, in terms of um, structures that we support, we support uh, as our flagship, but also a um, a four block pattern that's optimized for um, deployment on VNN IC pruners with um, quantization. Um, filter or a channel structure pruning is uh, supported, um, especially tested on image classification models. And then there's support for um, two four block pruning, which is preferred by um, like NVIDIA GPUs with Tensor RT. Uh, in terms of methods, we support um, magnitude. Um, pruning as a base um, with lots of research papers that come out of um, neural magic in our uh, partner lab, ISD Austria, um, including uh, some ACDC, which is alternating compression, decompression, um, second order methods like uh, NFAC and uh, OBS, and then um, implementation of other papers such as like movement pruning that came out of public phase. Um, in addition to pruning, we also support uh, quantization, have easy wrappers for things like model distillation. Um, so we have another question. I trained a model for 20 days, and it's giving 10 frames per second on YOLO v5. So I train it again using beat sparse uh, for to get better frames per second. Yeah, that's a great question, and the answer is uh, it depends on your um, one deployment environment, um, deployment targets, and also um, and then also your accuracy restrictions. 
Um, definitely looking into that um, the Pareto curve for where we're able to get um, models retraining with sparse ML and applying sparsification and deploying on CPUs with deep sparse is the first place to start. Um, if you see that we have an advertised model that matches your accuracy and performance restrictions, definitely is worth um, retraining using sparse ML for a deployment on deep sparse. Um, but happy to talk more as well about your specific requirements uh, through the deep sparse community. And we'll add a uh, link to that in the in call messages. Um, uh, just following up on that, Ben, I just wanted to call out uh, Mark, I think, mentioned this, but I think that this is a very important pathway exactly for that use case uh, is what we call the sparse transfer. So instead of uh, trying to sparsify uh, necessarily your model from scratch, um, you could try to take one of our already sparse models and transfer to your data set that normally is you know much faster and you don't really do the the specification bit um, so that's a, a, a very interesting uh, pathway that that is actually very useful in many in many use cases Definitely. so another question so this means deep sparse engine uses some software optimizations to skip over waste that is zero in the model on CPU right uh, yeah, this is correct. So the DSRS engine will analyze the weights ahead of time when the model is loaded, and it'll compile um, machine level instructions to write um, to write kernels to um, to run those convolutions and uh, fully connected layers um, by um, as sparse operations, skipping over any zeros in the model, which represent clean weights. Switching me back to um, Q and A now, and feel free to keep them coming. Um, we definitely have plenty of time. Let's see, is any model for uh, spatial raster data? So we don't support anything out of the box for this, uh, but it's definitely possible to use um, custom data both for um, training and deployment. On the training side, um, out of the box, like any data set you can make to be Cocoa like should work. And we can also provide support for doing more custom integration with your data set. On the deployment side, DeepSparse accepts on um, NumPy raises input. So as long as you can export the onyx and the model can and the inputs can represent as um, numpy arrays consumed by the model, then you're good to go. Um, do you hire remote workers from outside the US? Uh, we do, yes. Yeah, so our team is um, international with um, multiple people working remotely. Um, I said the US in Europe right now. Um, you know, it definitely can depend on country to country with um, user restrictions as well as uh, working hours. Um, but it's something that we are open to. Is there any way to keep my own class names using specification when training a custom data set? I'm using YOLO v5 to have issues with classes. So great question. Um, so I, I'm going to assume this means like the um, the class names are like predicted objects in the, um, in your YOLO in your custom object detection data set. Um, definitely um, need to look more into the specific error that we're seeing. Uh, you can feel free to open up an issue with us. We can dive more in. Um, but yeah, I think it really just comes down to the code and the specific error. I think that without more information, it's kind of hard to give a um, solid answer there. Um, but yeah, there, there shouldn't be anything that goes overriding the classes to like default Cocoa names or anything like that. Yeah, specification should not also touch. Uh, right, exactly. Yeah, we plug in pretty seamlessly. Yeah. Great. I think we are caught up on questions if there are uh, any more. All right. Well, I'm going to share okay. out the, uh, in, the invitation to join our uh, Slack community channel um, where, you know, any time of the day, um, you guys can reach out and I'll speak with our engineers. I'm happy to talk about potential use cases, uh, any bugs you're running into, help using the software. And in general, there's also just a growing community of people talking in general about their own use case, computer vision, NLP, or otherwise, um, you know, how our tools can be used to tackle them. And yeah, we'll give it um, two more minutes to let you guys trickle out. OK, so do you have another question? Um, how do you get the speed up in deep sparse? Any insights on that would be helpful on proprietary. Right, so specifically, um, you know, all of the tools you offer right now are open source with um, you know, that commercial license restriction on deep sparse. Um, but the actual um, compilation of the models is proprietary. Um, and we just released binaries for that. Um, but at, at a high level, um, 
you know, there's a few, a few tricks that we use, um, ranging from one, obviously taking advantage of sparsification, where um, you know hardware like CPUs that have a few cores but high cache are able to take advantage of a lot better over GPUs, which have many more cores but on low cache per core. Um, we also take advantage of um, you know, instruction sets that are available on CPU for um, vector instructions um, and take advantage of those while writing the sparse kernels. And then um, we also look at execution order. Um, right now, rather than going layer wise, um, we often look at patches of the model um, kind of like depth wise, um, kind of going horizontal to the model and computing um, section by section in what we call on tensor columns. Okay. Um, question, did you do a PhD to work on these things? Um, that is a great question. So originally the team that created the Deep Stress Engine spun out of um, an MIT professor's lab. And you know, they're a lab full of PhD students and graduates. Um, now as we build up the, the machine learning team, um, and I personally have a master's degree, not a PhD. Um, but we have a, a good mix throughout the team. Uh, Alex is a PhD and most of the research team as well. Um, you know, so definitely you know, it's a mix of experiences and also just drive and interest in the field when it comes to like, the team. We're, we all believe very much in you know, sparsification and kind of where like the industry needs to head in terms of making machine learning more accessible. Um, I think that's one of the big commonalities, but you know, definitely on um, PhD, not required, but um, very useful. See, all right, what is the difference between quantization, uh, which PyPorch is providing, and yours on uh, deep sparse? Yeah, great question. Um, so there's twofold here. One is the actual um, structural, um, the actual structural quantization in which um, we use PyPorch to do the quantization. So the layers that are being quantized are generally the same, you know, modulo some um, things we add in. Um, in terms of execution, um, you know, <laughs> We, um, you know, I can't speak so much for PyPorch. It's been a while, so I benchmark um, PyPorch CPU quantization. Um, but these sparse optimizes very heavily to write, um, you know, op optimized kernels for running um, in eight operations for you know common, um, you know, neural network layers. Um, so you're, you're generally going to see a lot better uh, speed up using deep sparse over uh, PyTorch, um, you know, at, at an eight level. And then you have a question. I'm new to computer vision, and I have a question. Does TensorFlow 2 object detection still a good choice now? Because I found that it's difficult to add more features, and it's not well documented, by the way. Thank you for your answer. So we um, specifically don't support uh, TensorFlow 2, uh, so I can't speak too much to that. Um, I don't know if, Alex, uh, you have anything to add. Uh, but definitely you know, getting started, I, I would heavily recommend looking at some of our flows in, um, in our transfer learning um, tutorials as that's a very easy way to get up and running with a performant model that can be easily deployed um, you know, with either you know, an existing data set or your own custom data set. Just by installing um, you know, sparse ML, deep sparse, and passing commands from the tutorial, you can get a model up and running pretty quickly. Um, okay. So as pruning the sparse ML support with knowledge distillation, uh, yes, we do. Um, so right now, um, that support's mostly around um, NLP with uh, transformers training, but we're um, in the process of adding support. And Alex is working very hard on this um, knowledge distillation for um, for computer vision models and option detection. Um, you know, you know, for, for I guess the rest of the crowd. So knowledge distillation um, means we're adding in um, some trained teacher model um, to the loss function to compare. So as we're um, so as we're pruning, we um, have some sort of quote unquote source of truth to trickle in with the loss and have that backflow with the gradients to keep like the, um, the knowledge we're losing kind of um, kind of retained as we go through the gradient descent process. So and we have a question here about uh, about the recording being available. And yes, uh, the recording should be made available uh, tomorrow on YouTube and uh, we'll be advertising in our social media channels as well. So we have a deep sparse, um, a must-do task uh, when starting training. Um, no, so deep sparse is for inference only. Um, but to get the most performance out of deep sparse, we want to apply sparsification 
using um, our sparse ML library, um, which will make the model run a lot faster on CPU. And then another question. If I have my own prune model that I prune using some other method, can I still run that on big sparse? So uh, great question. Uh, it depends on two things. Um, one, how the model is pruned. Um, so we definitely support um, you know, unstructured sparsity across like you know convolutional full connected layers. Um, you know, you'll need to have an Onyx export of it. And then the other is um, you know, just making sure that the operators um, are all supported by these sparse. You know, in general, we support a wide range of common operators. Um, but you know, our strategy is kind of been going from popular model to popular model and adding operators there. And you know, from there, you know, we build up a library of operators that cover a lot of common models. Um, so if it's very similar to you know YOLO or any of the transformer models or like mobile net stuff like that, we'll definitely support it. Um, we can also use the community to um, answer any further questions there about custom models. Great. Um, let's see if we have another Q and A question. Yeah, please mention the uh, YouTube channel. Great. Um, I'll put the link to the YouTube channel right now in the chat. Um, but if you look for a neural magic, um, that'll be us on YouTube. So this is a YouTube channel. Yeah, no. Um, thank you everyone for uh, joining as well. It's great to see uh, so many faces, so and so many uh, new ones as well. Um, great to see the community growing, and you know, please do join the Slack community. Um, you know, we love hearing about what people are working on, and um, you know how you know our mission aligns with um, you know the broader community. And yes, ARM support is definitely something I'm very excited for as well, um, both for the large servers and also getting more into Edge. And the community will definitely be very excited for stuff like uh, Raspberry Pi and Jetson support. Yeah, Alex, you want to take this one? Yeah, so um, <clears throat> there's someone asking about the difference between TensorT optimization and Deep Sparse. Uh, and, the, and the main difference is that TensorT limits the, uh, so it, uh, the, the newer, uh, the M, some Ampere, uh, um, NVIDIA GPUs, they support uh, a restricted form of specification, which allows you to spark, to prune two weights out of four, out of a consecutive four weights. So you can get at most 50% sparsity uh, there. Uh, with our technology, we allow for arbitrary pruning. So you can actually re remove pr uh, weights uh, in arbitrary locations in the model. And as, as you can look at the presentation, um, we have many models with over 90% uh, uh, sparsity. So those are, 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 those are the main uh, differences. And, but just to add to that, we also support, as Ben uh, mentioned, the, the 2-4 uh, uh, sparsity pattern that is su supported by, by TensorRT for NVIDIA uh, GPUs as well. So you can use our algorithms, our specification algorithms to generate uh, a, a TensorRT compatible uh, prune, uh, prune model. Great. Um, yeah, I don't see any other questions, and we're right at two. Um, but yeah, thank you again, everybody, for joining. And if you have any further questions on the Slack community or um, or GitHub issues, is a great way to great way to reach out. Um, and definitely, if you enjoy the presentation, feel free to um, share it on social media.